so welcome to Showcase of Nova Scotia Fossils and Geology. My name is Tim Fedak. I'm the Curator of Geology at the Nova Scotia Museum. And this series of talks is put together for grade 12 students here in Nova Scotia to reach out and touch base with international paleontologists uh, who've done work here in the province and to learn about uh, some spectacular fossils and geology. Today is a great privilege uh, uh, to have Dr. Paul Olson uh, from Lamont Doherty uh, Earth Observatory at Columbia University uh, talking today about his past experience with fossils and his work here in Nova Scotia. So welcome, Paul. Thank you very much. It's a real pleasure to be here. So uh, I have with me today uh, Luke uh, Allen, a co-host. Uh, so Luke's a grade 10 student from uh, Citadel High School here in Nova Scotia. So Hi, Luke. Good morning. Good morning. Um, Paul, what's that uh, background you have behind you? Oh, that's, uh, those are cliffs at uh, Lomadin Provincial Park, and they have what are called sedimentary cycles in them that reflect changes in climate on Earth. And I'll talk about that near the end of my talk. But I like the background because that image and the concept of those cycles brings us a full circle in the, uh, in the ideas that I want to present to you guys. Okay. Yeah, so you've collected a lot of important fossils here in Nova Scotia, uh, but you've also, I guess, prominently looked at the sedimentology and, the, and, the, the, and those cycles in the, the mudstones and sandstones. What a treasure the Bay of Fundy is uh, in terms of a rift basin, the, the Pangaea ripping apart and this structure sinking uh, over, was it 40 million years that the uh, Bay of Fundy was going down? At least. The, the, uh, if it weren't for the Bay of Fundy, uh, North America would not have the wealth of fossils that it has from this early part of the age of dinosaurs. Uh, the erosion of the Bay of Fundy is continually renewing those rock outcrops. So even if you collect something one year and uh, it goes to a museum, the next year there's likely to be something else. Yep. Really grateful for you joining us uh, today. And so I guess you'll give us a bit of an overview of your really interesting background of sure. uh, how you started to co collect fossils when you were young. I want to uh, first say that one of the messages that I, I try to communicate in general is the interconnectedness of all things. It, none of the play things we're interested in are as a broken down into chunks or disciplines as we might think they are. Because in reality, the world really is interconnected. And these things not only have a real existence connected, but you can actually learn about one thing that transfers to another that informs you back on something else. So it, it's kind of a, a, virtu a virtuous uh, spiral, if you will. Um, now, I've had an interest in paleontology and dinosaurs since I was a little kid. And in fact, I was one of those kinds of little kids that annoys everybody by, by trying to talk to them about everything I knew about dinosaurs at the time. And here I am uh, at the 1964 World's Fair in uh, Queens, New York. And so I continued my interest in dinosaurs all the way through grade school and into high school. And, uh, and when I was um, about 16 years old, uh, my mom brought home a uh, an article in the newspaper which said a dinosaur footprint had been found in my house. And I and another friend went to this quarry in which this dinosaur footprint had been found in Livingston, New Jersey. And while at the quarry and trying to figure out what had fossils in them, I met a man named Robert Salkin, who was a, uh, actually a metal shop teacher, but was also an educator who was using uh, fossils to teach inner, inner city school kids how uh, to read and to, to draw and to map all by using fossils. And here he is on Captain Kangaroo in 1971. And this guy basically took me under his wing and he showed me how to collect the dinosaur footprints at this site in, in New Jersey. And uh, I got a real interest in this as in my friends and we started to excavate and find many, many, many fossil footprints. And that's really where I got my start in paleontology. And here I am as a 17 year old with a, a friend of mine, Bruce, Lord I, and we are excavating. And this was really, really hard work. 
Uh, we were digging holes in solid rock. As you can see, we're getting into the size of a small house foundation here. But we did find hundreds and hundreds of dinosaur footprints. Um, what this guy Salkin did is he not just showed us the footprints, but he was pretty well connected and knew a lot of scientists. So in the early age of 17, he introduced me to, uh, to a series of paleontologists. The most important in my history was a, a fellow named Don Baird at Princeton University. And, and Don was a very, very patient person. So he introduced me at a really early age to the academic study of paleontology, to getting uh, involved with various um, academic papers and literature and really learning very deeply about it. At the same time, at the same time, our fossil excavations at this site in New Jersey were becoming very extensive and was receiving quite a bit of publicity. So they, we started a campaign to get the site preserved. And here, uh, here I am on the right with my friend Tony and some dinosaur footprints. And in the background on the left is Bob Salk and the person in the middle is, uh, is Tom Kane, who was the governor, became the governor ultimately of New Jersey, and then led the 9-11 Commission, which you may remember uh, after 9-11 uh, in, in New York City. Um, and, uh, and indeed, we did succeed in having it converted to a park. And in 1970, it, the land was ceded over to the Park Commission in the area, and, uh, and the site uh, became protected and still is today. Although it's not developed as anything you can go visit, it's still a, a natural resource. And in fact, in the U.S. is a natural national landmark. Now, this propelled me uh, to get very, very interested in, in fossils of various sort. And Don Baird was instrumental in, uh, in that undertaking. And I got inter in, interested not just in the footprints, but also in fossil fish and other things that were in the area. And he left such an impression on me that I, I did this painting of him and my friend Tony and I in 1971, I was examining a, uh, a, a, a cast of some footprints that we had collected. And art has always played an integral part in, in my science. Now, Don Baird had visited Nova Scotia some 11 years earlier when this painting was done. And he was introduced to the fossils of the Bay of Fundy, uh, especially the Triassic and Jurassic fossils, those from the beginning of the age of dinosaurs, by Bill Take who was at that time a uh, curator, I believe, of the Nova Scotia Museum. And he showed Don where he had been finding various fossils. And here they are examining a plaster jacket that they had painstakingly recovered under a ledge uh, near uh, Burnt Coat uh, in Nova Scotia. Uh, and uh, they're applying glue to it to, to preserve it. And Don has his characteristic pipe, which is smoking uh, on the site. Now, uh, and at the time, there were two basic different lava flow sequences that were interbedded with the sediments that produced these fossils. So on the left here, we have a, a diagram from Sidney Powers uh, in 1916, and then in the middle by George Degree Klein in 1962, and the, and the right uh, two authors, Hubert and Mertz, in 1980. And in all three cases, you can see you have a lower sequence of sandstones and shales, the wolf fill and vomiting formation, and then overlying North Mountain Basalt, and then some Scotts Bay formation on top of it. It was called Scotts Bay at the time. And then you see the blue unit, and by 1962, it was called the McKay of Basalt, which was inherited in 1980. Now, this got me, as a very young paleontologist just going off to Yale University, really exciting. Because everywhere in North America that you have these lava flows, these basalt flows, um, you can get a date, a radiometric date, of how many years old those rocks are. Uh, and if it were correct that there was this other unit in Nova Scotia, the McKay Head Basalts or Five Island Volcanics, as they were called, that would mean that there was another lava flow really low in the sequence, the very same age as the fossils that take and bear were finding uh, in Nova Scotia in the Triassic. So I went up there uh, multiple times trying to figure out if I could obtain an age uh, from those uh, lava flows that were low in the sequence and thereby date the early uh, uh, development of the age of dinosaurs. And one of the very first places I went to was in North Shore of the Minas Basin, a place called Five Islands Provincial Park. And uh, I went down to the beach 
and looked at these wonderful rock outcrops. You can see the lava flows in the background of the salts, and the geology is really very complicated. Uh, and there's been very, very, very little work done at, at the site uh, in, this, in that whole North Shore, in fact, of the, of the Minas Basin, as opposed to the South Shore, where a lot more fossils have been found. And so this was in 1972. I'd gone up there with a couple of friends of mine, and one of the first things we found at Five Islands were some dinosaur footprints. These turned out to be the very first dinosaur footprints from Eastern Canada. Uh, and what got my attention was that these footprints looked very, very much like the fossils that I was finding in New Jersey back in that dinosaur park. The second time I went up, I went up with Don Baird and I went up with Jack Horner, who was working with Donald Baird at that time at the Princeton University Museum. And we, uh, we, uh, we found additional footprints but we also found some fossil fish. And this is an example that's on, on display at the Fundy Geological Museum. Uh, and uh, we found a lot of footprints and some of them were quite large, like the one on the left. And we immediately recognized that these kinds of footprints that we're finding were not what we expected from these rocks that should have been older than the basalt flow uh, that was present at Five Islands. It's Five Islands volcanics, so even if they had basalt. Uh, we didn't, uh, that came as a surprise and we didn't quite understand it. Now we knew that these footprints meant something in terms of age because many, many years before, back in 1836, footprints nearly identical to these had been discovered in the Connecticut Valley, uh, particularly in Massachusetts, and had been described by the right Reverend Edward Hitchcock, who ultimately became the president of Amherst College. And from 1836 onward, he amassed a gigantic collection of 20,000 so, uh, or so fossil footprints and wrote enormous monographs on these footprints. And they, they're very characteristic. This one here is a very famous footprint called the Ubrontes giganteus. Uh, it was first found in Massachusetts, but it became by accident the state fossil of Connecticut in the USA. Uh, but these are very characteristic fossils, often found interbedded in layers of lava, uh, but not at the bottom of the sedimentary sequence, but rather near the top. So here's Hitchcock uh, and his very first paper, which was a real uh, headliner at the time. Uh, this was in 1836, Ornithicnology, Description of Footmarks of Birds, which is what they thought they were. They look like birds. Uh, we now know why they look like birds, because bear birds had inherited the foot structure of dinosaurs. Uh, on New Red Sandstone in Massachusetts, uh, and, uh, and these were really characteristic, as we now know, Jurassic type footprints. So I decided it would be a good idea to spend more time and more effort looking uh, at the North Shore of the Minas Basin around the area of Five Islands. And one of the areas I went to ultimately was Wasson Bluff. Wasson Bluff had actually been figured in a, in a diagram by, by uh, John William Dawson in 1878 in the book Acadian Geology. And you can see by the various ways the, the, the layers are twisted and turned in this diagram that the geology is very confusing. And this confusing geology, you see a photograph of the same area that's shown by the red lines right below it, uh, was so confusing it basically dissuaded paleontologists from looking at this in any detail. Now Dawson was in touch with Lyell. Uh, even before he had done this panel diagram of Wasson Bluff. Charles Lyell was famous as the father of, of stratigraphy uh, back in the 1830s. Uh, he knew Dawson, uh, Dawson knew Hitchcock, Charles Lyell knew Hitchcock, and these people all talked to each other about the bird tracks in Massachusetts and the, the, the nature of the, the Fundy Basin itself, the current Fundy Basin, how it might have been an analog, it was wrong, but an idea, analog for the, uh, for the, for the red rocks that were which were in the area, uh, and, uh, and they developed a network, an early network at the time of understanding of how these rocks had formed. Uh, and by the, um, by the latter 20th century, we had this idea, as shown on the left side of this diagram, that you had this lower level of lava, as I mentioned before, an upper level of lava. At, and when we found these footprints at Five Islands, it started to become clear that that wasn't the case. And in fact, the geology was a little complicated and the blue layer was actually the same as the yellow layer and there were all the North Mountain basalt. And if you can see my cursor here, 
This region here in Wasson Bluff had particularly confusing geology, and as a consequence, uh, we decided to focus on that area a little bit more. So I went back there a uh, second time with Don Baird in 1976. In, at Wasson Bluff, I found some scraps of bone weathering out of the hill. Uh, here's Wasson Bluff in 1976. I'm the person with the hard hat walking by. This is a picture taken by Don Baird. This is after I had come back from Wasson Bluff with some fossils, and Don Baird and Jack Horner, who you see standing in that dark outfit uh, next to the hills, recovering a dinosaur bone. Because the little scraps of material that I had found at Wasson Bluff days before turned out to be a neck bone of a dinosaur. And, and it was in many fragments when I found it, and I wasn't even convinced it was bone, but of course, Don Baird uh, and I and Jack Horner fit it together to make this single uh, vertebra of a prosauropod dinosaur that belongs in the neck. This is a, a reconstruction of the skeleton of a, of a dinosaur, an uh, ankysaurus, a small prosauropod dinosaur from the Connecticut Valley. What was exciting about this, though, is there was more than one bone. And of course, we know that Tim Fettick uh, has gone back and found uh, over the years quite a few skeletons of prosauropods here, not just the scraps that I found, but actual, uh, actual skeletons, uh, and that these are the oldest dinosaurs, dinosaur bones in eastern North America at this point. They're the oldest prosauropods in all of North America, uh, and they represent the very first invasions into North, into North America from higher latitudes like Greenland and, and Germany, and southern latitudes like Argentina, in the at the close of the Triassic. Now, on that same trip in 1976, we didn't just look at Wasson Bluff and collect some of the bones of these early dinosaurs, but we went to the other shore to look at other areas that hadn't been looked at in very much detail, and one of these was near Medford. And uh, this was one of these areas that had very few bones, but we decided to take a look at it anyway, having just had success someplace else that wasn't supposed to have any bones, and we didn't find any bones. But what we did find was uh, were dinosaur were footprints, which we thought were dinosaurs at the time, and they were not, but we thought they were. Uh, and I remember very well when we saw the first slab just lying there on the beach, uh, Don Baird exclaimed, well, that's not what I expected. Uh, and this was it. This was this slab of footprints. And what is so unusual about these footprints, they look like dinosaurs. They're quite small. As you can see, that scale bar is a few centimeters. Um, is there's this pan right over the scale bar. Uh, if you can see that right over the scale bar in this area here, there's a little hand associated with this foot. This turns out to be a type of animal, a footprint we call a triopus. And we now recognize that it's a relative of dinosaurs, but not quite a dinosaur. In subsequent years, we found many, many footprints, hundreds of footprints at this site. Uh, here's a beautiful slab that was collected in the 80s uh, of not just this dinosaur-like form of Triopus, but also a crocodile relative called Brachychirotherium, which is the light-colored track in the middle. Now, I went back many, many times to Wasson Bluff over the years from 1976. Every year I went back into the 80s. And one year in the very early 80s, I found a block of rock at Wasson Bluff that had a little bit of bone sticking out of it. That rock, when the fossil was fully prepared, had this absolutely gorgeous three-dimensional skull of a lizard relative called the Sphenodontin. The only part of this skull that was exposed at the time was the little part encircled by the red line here. And, and uh, I started to scrape away at that and uncover what was present. And I said, oh my goodness, a whole jaw. And then when I dug a little deeper and saw there was more of the skull there, I said, ah, I'm going to stop here. And I send it off to my colleagues at Harvard, uh, Neil Shubin and his colleagues who had it properly prepared uh, at, at Harvard. It's a, it's a beautiful specimen, and it's one of those things you never know the kind of thing you're going to find on the shores of the Bay of Fundy. This was in a loose rock, although we figured out where it was from, uh, but it was one of the motivations for uh, asking National Geographic for funding and coming back in, in the uh, early 1980s to collect much larger amounts of fossils at Boston Bluff. It was very, very exciting times. Now, in my many trips up to Nova Scotia very early on, Don introduced me to a, a, a local phenomena, uh, Eldon George, who we see here in later years, uh, me in later years too, uh, and, uh, and of course, uh, 
Tim. And uh, Eldon uh, collected many, many, many fine footprints of uh, Triassic, Jurassic age uh, in the um, Five Islands and uh, Wasson Bluff and uh, um, in the um, area around McKay Head, all along that North Shore. Now, this air, these areas are now protected. Uh, you uh, can pick things up on the beach and bring them to museums if they're in danger of being destroyed, but you can't really dig them out of the cliff unless you have uh, permits. And this is something you have to be very careful about because this is part of the heritage of the region, a paleontological and cultural resource that, that needs to be fostered and protected. Uh, and so the footprints Eldon collected have gone now to the, uh, to the museum. Uh, here they are. Here's some of the footprints. He found many more than this. But these are true dinosaur footprints on the left, uh, both plant eaters and meat eaters. And on the right, on the lower right, you have the hand of a plant eating dinosaur. Uh, and uh, above that is the footprint of a crocodile relative. The coin is there, uh, alumni in all cases, to show you the, the relative size of the footprints. Between Eldon George's discoveries, the discoveries we made at Wasson Bluff, and all of these footprints and the foot fossils that Don Barrett had described and discovered with Bill Tate, these all allowed us a really unusual look at the transition between the Triassic and the Jurassic period. And it turned out that those lava flows that were so confusing and, and, and so in need of being looked at and figuring out ended up being key to the understanding of that transition between the Triassic and Jurassic. So back in uh, 1987, I had a paper in, in science, uh, and uh, that's with Neil and a colleague of mine, Mark Anders. And in this, we took a look at the fossils, especially from Wasson and Bluff, with the idea that they were unique in the world. They still are really in coming from directly on top of the North Mountain basalt of one of these lava flows that itself is immediately on top of the evidence of the mass extinction at about 200 and two million years ago, which marks a transition from when dinosaurs were a rare, parts of the, rare part of the ecological community to when they were dominant. Uh, and so the Wasson Bluff fossils ended up being instrumental in showing what was around at the time and was really unusual in, in sampling both aquatic systems and lakes and terrestrial systems all in the same place and all above a datable lava flow. Now, since, uh, since the 80s, since I was a professor, I've had a series of graduate students, and one of my early graduate students, Sarah Fole, worked on outcrops along the Bay of Fundy, especially at this spot called Parkridge Island, which is uh, right next to Parsboro. Uh, and the red rocks you're seeing are part of the Blominin Formation, the latest Triassic Age, and they're overlain by this North Mountain basalt. And right under that, right under the basalt, are layers that have fossil pollen and spores that you see in the lower right. And Sarah studied these uh, fossil pollen and spores, and she showed that you could see this huge change in plant life right below this lava flow, marking the transition from Triassic life to Jurassic life. So taking all these footprints together, the new data on pollen and spores that Sarah Fall had worked on, we were able to put uh, all of these fossils from North America, not just ones from Nova Scotia, but ones from New Jersey and Pennsylvania and North Carolina, into a very tightly constrained time framework that showed how catastrophic the end of the Triassic was, how so much of the reptile, amphibian fauna of the world was decimated. All the kinds of animals that were present in the rocks that Don Baird had been collecting fossils on with Bill Tate, those were gone and replaced by dinosaurian dominance, by the beginnings of the kinds of animals that we're all familiar with in textbooks, like the ancestors of brontosaurus and so forth. And so we were able to get our first look at how abrupt this transition was, and we're able to obtain an actual date on the lava flow that was about 202 million years, which wasn't known very precisely at the time. So I have I've had a, a series of graduate students who have worked on, uh, on these deposits, like Roy Slisher, who was my very first student, Sarah Fole, Peter Letourneau, Emma Rainforth, who've made many contributions to the study of footprints, including in Nova Scotia, uh, Jessica Whiteside, who's worked on uh, Nova Scotia in detail as well, uh, Jean Wu, who's now at IVPP in, in Beijing, 
has worked on uh, early mammal relatives, and then Strolling Nesbitt. So we were able to, much more recently in 2013, find minute crystals of zircon in the North Mountain Basalt and other layers of lava in North America, and very precisely date them at 201.564 plus or minus 13,000 years. Amazing precision. So we understand that transition in great detail now. Now this takes us back, and, and here are these la layers of these very laterally continuous alternations between sandstones and muds. I was interested in why some layers had footprints, like this beautiful footprint from Pennsylvania of Triassic age on the left, and other layers just a few meters away in sequence, vertical sequence, had fossil fish and looked like they were deposited in the deep lake. Why did you have these alternations? Well, that actually be explained in the early 60s as being related to variations in the Earth's orbit causing climate changes, which uh, caused uh, evaporation and precipitation changes, which caused the lakes in these rift valleys to go up and down. So here's a quarry in Pennsylvania. The, the dark layers are like the red mudstones we saw in the picture at the Plomidon. Uh, and the lighter colored rocks here are like the sandstones we saw in Cape Longview. And it turns out that the amount of time between each of those black shales is about 20,000 years. Uh, those cycles, the cycles because they're alternation and repetitive patterns, uh, they uh, make bundles of about 100,000 years, and they make bundles of other cycles that are 400,000 years, and they're even longer term cycles. And these turn out to all be controlled by variations in the Earth's orbit. By the 90s, I got really, really interested in this problem, and we thought, well, if we could get somehow a, comp a long record, many, many millions of years, tens of million years record of these variations in lake levels and get a precise look at them, we could do a lot of things with the history of time uh, and understanding ancient climate. And so we started a a project of coring uh, these rocks, in this case in the Newark Basin in, in New Jersey, and we collected about uh, 6,700 meters of core. Uh, and we showed unequivocally that these lake level cycles continued through the whole sequence and that they were all controlled by variations in the Earth's orbit. And these variations in the Earth's orbit come about through gravitational attractions of the planet. Well, I thought, well, that's really interesting. You know, we don't really know much about the motions of the planets going back that far. Maybe we could get information out of the geological record from these rocks that are hundreds of millions of years old that we can't get out of celestial planets, which is the study of the motions of the planets as they're affected by their, uh, by their own gravity and one another. And so I, I coined the term geological order. An orrery is a mechanical device that models the behavior of the solar system according to the ideas Copernicus, Kepler, and Newton. Uh, and they're models of the solar system that were used uh, for educational purposes and also for predicting eclipses. And they're called uh, orreries because the fourth or, or Earl of Orrery, an orrery is part of uh, Ireland and is now part of Cork. And this Earl of Orrery commissioned the clockwork mechanism for the, these what are called grand orreries, a very, very expensive. And he spent so much money that they gave him the name of the device. So it's called an orrery. So the geological orrery would be a mechanism of understanding the motions of the planets from using the geological record. And from that information, we're able to work out actual numerical estimates of things like the movement of the perihelion of Mercury. Here we have a diagram of the movement of the orbit of Mercury and perihelion, which is the point at which the Mercury is closest to the sun. And we can work this out for all the planets 200 million years ago, for real. And this has become a growing branch of science. This is my colleague, Jack Laskar, uh, and he's showing how we can extract these orbital parameters 200 million years ago from the rock record. But wait, there's more. Because what you can do with this information is you know that the mathematical material that goes into the, into the 
uh, solutions, the celestial mechanical solutions for the planet, has to agree when you project it back 200 million years to the actual history of the planetary motions which you recover through these lake level cycles. We can actually figure out if the physics is right that's in those equations that we build the models out of. There are a lot of unknowns here. For example, one possibility based on the most modern physics is that there is a disk of dark matter in the plane of our galaxy. And it's thought that our solar system oscillates through that plane with a period of about 60 million years. So it passes through twice each cycle. Now here we have the uh, a diagram of the galaxy and new theories indicate that the gravity, which is very, very minute uh, of that dark matter, we don't really know exists, by the way, it's mathematically predicted, but we don't know it exists. Uh, that that could perturb the motions of comets and asteroids. So they increase the frequency of crossing Earth's orbit and potentially colliding with it. And in fact, that the same dark matter could interact with the core of the Earth, making lava flows more likely. So that if we had records like these lake level cycles that I've been talking about before, that extended from say 50 million years to 200 million years ago, we could see if the solar system motions of the planets were being perturbed by this plane of dark matter in the plane of our galaxy. And that takes us a full circle because it's that dark matter that could have perturbed the core that could have resulted in the lava flows at the end of the Triassic, like the North Mountain Basalt. That's part of a giant lava flow sequence called the Central Atlantic Magnetic Comets which we think was actually the killer that caused the mass extinction that brought in the, modern, the age of dinosaurs after that extinction. So these lake cycles tell us about the physics that could test the idea that the solar system's passing through the galactic plane and these perturbations are occurring and causing these lava flows and mass extinctions. And these are the very things which we learn about uh, at Boston Bluff in the Bay of Fundy, coming full circle from footprints to lava flows, to cycle, to planets, to lava flows, to bones and footprints. And that's basically the kind of story that I want to give you, one of the interconnectedness of the entire universe and how the most mundane things can end up telling us about quite remarkable things. And that is a remarkable talk. <laughs> that is, that is wonderful. Thank you so much, Paul. Sure. I was uh, struck by you showing the photo of um, Charles Lyell and Hitchcock and Dawson, you know, Nova Scotia's first geologist. And Charles Lyell was walking along the shore, perhaps even at Blomidon, that image you have behind you. I, have, yeah, he I'd was walking along the shore. <laughs> I'd be shocked if he didn't go to Wasson Bluff. Yeah, amazing. And at, uh, at, during that time, he's looking to the past. He's looking at modern landscapes to interpret the the rocks, and then the rocks to interpret. Yes. Yeah. So it was a back and forth. So uh, amazing that that uh, happens. Uh, where that has taken us. <laughs> uh, well, as I said, it's all connected, and the the complexities at Wasson Bluff, which, as you know, having yourself spent so many years on that coastline. There's nothing simple about that geology. In fact, I'd like to say it's, it's on the edge of incomprehensibility. <laughs> I agree with that. <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, collecting those dinosaurs you were talking about, you know, you would, you'd be collecting a, a limb bone. It would be beautiful, well-preserved, and it just stop. Stops. And you have to look a little bit, 10 centimeters this way and two centimeters. And there it is again. It's, everything is all chopped up and, and right. moved around. So. Probably the reason that area is so rich is uh, at the time of the eruption of these lavas, that area was moving quite a bit. And these were actually holes in the ground. Right, right. Okay. Uh, and they yeah. filled up really fast. The yeah. total amount of time of the cliff in back of you might only be on the order of 100,000 years. Amazing. The total amount of time. Yeah. Maybe, maybe 150 or 200,000 years, but no more. Yeah. 
Yeah. And if you had that amount of time down the barometer, that would be several million years worth of mm. stratigraphy. Yeah. But, but things were really happening fast, and, and rocks were literally falling from the cliffs right into that hole. Yeah. Uh, and I wonder if those dinosaurs that are in there actually couldn't get out. Right. Or they're walking along a cliff and there's an earthquake because there right. would have been earthquakes all the time. All the time. All the time. There. Fall That's down why the all the rock there is so sliced up with those little faults that are cutting up your dinosaur bones. Yeah, yeah. Um, that's wonderful. Uh, I'll just jump to Luke. See, do you have any questions for Paul? Yeah, yeah. Um, so you, see, you seem to take things from a sedimentological point of view. Uh, do you think this is really important for someone going to paleontology? Well, it depends on what you want to focus on. Many of my colleagues come from the biology side, and they are very effective and wonderful paleontologists, and others come more from the, the, the geological side. Um, I, I actually, my degree is in biology. My PhD is in biology. And so I have sort of a foot in each camp. Uh, and uh, uh, I do look at it biologically, but I cannot escape the connection between that biology and, and the physical worlds. To me, right. these things are just totally, completely interlinked. Uh, and uh, and uh, so I see them as one thing, not as two things. Right. Um. And also, you mentioned a lot about the footprints. Yes. Um, how do you think technology is important in paleontology? And what, can, and what can it tell us? So technology, what's wonderful about footprints is they are the only record that we have of moving extinct animals. Foot, footprints in burrows, technological objects, they are the only thing we have of moving organisms. Uh, in footprints, we tend to prize those footprints that show actually the least effects of that motion that are the, the best sort of reproductions of the soles of the, the feet of the dinosaurs. But um, there's a growing body of, uh, of techniques that allow us to explore the three-dimensional motions of what we would normally think of as rather sloppy footprints. But they're the actual motion of the foot moving in and moving out again, out of the mud. Right. So it's, it, that gives us information about the actual motions of the dinosaurs. And, and there are other things that can, they can tell us as well. For example, um, and this was noticed at the very beginning of footprint technology with Hitchcock, is you could see what the skin of the soles of the feet were like on these dinosaurs, which look very bird-like. They yeah. don't look so much like lizard skin. Lizard skin tend to have rectangular scales on the soles of the feet, while the, the feet of the dinosaurs have pebbly skin that looks exactly like the skin of birds. Uh, in addition, there are sometimes very, very rare times, in fact, I only know one that's unequivocal, where a dinosaur is sat down, planting a dinosaur, and not only can you see the scales on its feet, but on its tail, where its wow. tail's impressed. And not just that, but further back on the tail, you can see what looked like fibers, which we now realize dinosaurs have feathers, and right. these are certainly the feathers of that dinosaur. And, and they, this, these are the, this is the earliest known record of feathers in dinosaurs. And it's interesting that it's in, in a fishing dinosaur, not in a saurischian, not in a theropod, because this is one of those pieces of evidence that show that all the branches of dinosaurs had feathers at one stage or another in their evolution. Wow. Um, and lastly, how does paleontology apply to the modern world? Well, paleontology is the record of life of the past. Uh, we are preoccupied with humans uh, being uh, future thinking animals uh, with the future, but when we make models of the future, we can't do that and, and have any direct tests of what our models are doing because, well, it's in the future. It hasn't happened yet. But a lot of the experiments that we're interested in, we could call, for example, uh, the anthropogenic problem with CO2 as an experiment. Well, this experiment has happened in the past. There have been experiments about this in the past. When the lava flows of the Central Atlantic Magnetic Province came out, in a period of tens of thousands of years, carbon dioxide levels doubled in the atmosphere. It's exactly the same kind of thing is happening now with fossil fuels. So these experiments happen. Paleontology and geologists give us a window into those natural experiments in the past. They're a place to look for how things play out with these great experiments. It's not comforting to learn for example, that when CO2 doubled, there was a mass extinction. Now, the exact mechanisms of that extinction are almost certainly not like what we're 
seeing right now, which are mostly due to direct human activities like habitat loss, but that CO2 doubling could affect ocean acidification. And we know that's affecting coral reefs now, along with the temperature increase. And what we saw at the end of the Triassic with that increase of CO2 is coral reefs were extirpated from the entire world. All coral reef reefs in the world disappeared. Some species of coral survived just barely, and they gave rise to all the rest of the corals after that. Now that effect is probably one of the CO2. Right. So that gives us an idea of what these um, experiments uh, might have in store. And that's why one of the reasons paleontology is important. But I want to say one other piece of, pale, of importance, and that is what was learned and is still being learned uh, originally in the early 19th century. And that is that these fossils put humans in perspective, in a cosmological perspective. Where do we fit in the world? Where do we fit in the history of time? And it gives us that perspective. And without that history, we wouldn't have that perspective. And so dinosaur paleontologists and Darwin were very much like Copernicus in taking the world from being the center of the universe and showing where we really are. Same kinds of things with biology as with the planets. Well, thank you. I find your presentation really interesting. My and, pleasure. Uh, My pleasure. Yeah. It's all connected, man. <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much, Paul. Uh, and uh, we hope to have you uh, back up in Nova Scotia sometime very soon. Very soon. Bye-bye. <laughs>